Being and Caring, A Psychology for Living by Victor Daniels and Lawrence J. Horowitz, as read by The Happy President. Part 3, Living with Feeling. Chapter 14, Defensive Processes and Beyond. My interest in events inside and outside me grows out of my awareness, and my wish to make contact grows out of that interest. In turn, contact leads to new areas of my awareness. By contrast, when aspects of my environment are uncomfortable, painful, or overwhelming, I may want to minimize my contact with them to allow the rest of my life to continue. Ways of avoiding contact with ourselves and others, however, can become so habitual and generalized that they interfere with our ability to enjoy ourselves. For example, certain inhibitions do that. I'm inhibited when I don't do something I'd like to do because I'm afraid of someone's disapproval. Avoidance of awareness. We all defend ourselves by escaping from a threat, acting vigorously to nullify it, or diverting it. By attending clearly, I can deal effectively with most threats, but I get into trouble when my method of defending is to deceive myself about what's happening. When my awareness of an event becomes unpleasant, painful, and uncomfortable, my options include blocking out the experience and denying my discomfort. These tactics lead to distorting or denying reality. In an 1899 paper on the substitution of neutral memories for painful ones, Freud wrote, since the elements of the experience which aroused objection were precisely the important ones, the substituted memory will necessarily lack those important elements and will in consequence most probably strike us as trivial. Through such substitution, I can become alienated from myself, from those qualities that live on in my shadow side, hidden and unseen by me, though they're often visible to others. I can resist awareness by putting someone else between me and the threatening thoughts and feelings. I look at the issue and see only the distraction I've put between me and it, or don't see anything there at all. I can avoid awareness by looking away from the issue. I let myself be sidetracked by my world of distracting events. One way I can distract myself from feeling uncomfortable is by jumping from one thing to another. When I feel embarrassed, I may scan for some event that can distract me. Then my attention jumps to that distraction, blocking out my thoughts and feelings about my embarrassment. All this happens in an instant. When some kind of apparently unconnected chatter or nonsense comes through my mind with great force, for example, I look for what's behind or underneath it. Jumping from one thing to another can also help me avoid facing my problems with another person. You and I may need to deal seriously with matters important to us both, but as soon as we touch a sensitive topic, one of us brings up something else. If that in turn gets touchy, we find yet another issue to distract us. Probably, I suddenly have to go to the toilet. Distraction works especially well in groups, since each person brings in sources of distraction. I have attended meetings in which we had important things to do but got almost nothing done. We consistently moved on to something else before finishing the previous matter. After such meetings, I found myself thinking, we spent two hours in there and we didn't finish anything. For this to happen, we all have to agree tacitly to let ourselves be distracted. Such cooperation. This can also occur in counseling. When a person says, let's move on, it's wise to double check. Do you feel finished with that? Ready to close the books on it? Almost invariably the response is, I guess not. Hiding one feeling behind another is another form of distraction. I might, for instance, joke about something that's frightening to me. In the paratroops, I was the funniest guy you ever heard. I'd look around and see some of the men on my plane trembling with terror. I knew that same terror. My way of handling it was to get so funny that by the time we had to jump, we were laughing so hard our eyes were watering. Another way to cry. 
I'm sure some people resented my avoidance. I'd rather not have to be funny when I'm afraid. I can also avoid something by getting irritated or angry about it. Often, my irritation or anger is a straightforward response to the present situation. But when I'm angry about past history, my own or in general, like rehashing the Civil War, I'm probably using my anger to resist being in touch with something that's going on in me or in you right now. The same is true when I'm angry about some possible future event, like what will happen if my irritation or anger about an event in some other time and place is likely to provoke anger from you in return. The fight or tense exchange that follows blocks out all awareness of the current event that I wanted to avoid. The defense mechanisms. Freud called some of our defensive processes mechanisms. Ordinarily, they operate in an apparently adaptive, mechanical way that lies outside our ordinary consciousness. Most of the defense mechanisms are exaggerations of normal processes. They are a source of problems when they distort our real world in our attempts to respond to its stresses. A mini catalog of defense mechanisms. No doubt you've always wanted a convenient catalog of the principal defense mechanisms. Here it is. Compensation. I try to compensate for a real or imagined lack in one area by doing well in another. A physically handicapped person may become an outstanding artist or scholar. A parent may make up for personal disappointments by bullying the children to achieve. Deflection. The aim is deflected, off target, or out of focus. I hate to sit in a room with smokers instead of, Jean, please smoke in the hall. Or the complaint deals with a detail instead of the main point. Can be useful in maintaining contact by saying something softly like the Chinese, we will consider it for discussion instead of no. Denial of reality, often shortened to denial. I behave as though unpleasant thoughts, facts, wishes, actions, or situations do not exist or are not so, and believe an alternative, more satisfying image of how things are. He couldn't possibly have taken a bribe. The jury must have made a mistake. Idealization. I construct a glorified image of another person or object, support it with inner speech and imagery, and show it in attitudes and actions. All politicians want precinct workers who are prone to such overestimation. It helps to enlist other mechanisms such as rationalization and denial in its support. Identification. Adopting another's values, attitudes, and behavior in reality or fantasy I think of myself as similar to that person. Normal. Children identify with parents in learning conscience, values, and the like. A movie audience identifies with E.T. Pathological. A psychotic identifies with Napoleon or other powerful figure in history. Introjection. I uncritically swallow whole some way of being. Unless I evaluate what's acceptable and unacceptable to me, I can end up suppressing my personal self. Like identification, introjection is important in early socialization. Isolation. I compartmentalize and isolate events or ideas that may, if recognized as similar, lead to questioning my beliefs or feelings. Obsessions and compulsions. Being unable to keep all insistent thoughts out of my mind or rigidly carrying out repetitive tasks that keep my thoughts and energy distracted. Projection. By assigning my unacknowledged and unacceptable desires, feelings, impulses, shortcomings, and disliked qualities to others, I'm less vulnerable or subject to criticism. My con artist self thinks everyone is dishonest. My sexually repressed male self sees all women as out to seduce me. This mechanism is an essential element in paranoia and war. Rationalization. I substitute acceptable, worthwhile motives and logic for unacceptable acts or feelings. This protects my self-image. 
I unconsciously attribute admirable motives to my behavior when it is actually animated by greed, selfishness, revenge, or other reprehensible motives. Sour grapes. A close relationship would intrude on my community responsibilities. Sweet lemon. My firing him is a valuable lesson. Exploitation. Business is business. Reaction formation. I do just the opposite of a strong unconscious urge, believing I don't have that reprehensible desire and am repelled by it. The feeling, attitude, or behavior may be fanatical, rigid, or grossly overdone. I become overly protective when my hostility is too much. My super nice guy could probably kill you. My extensive sex life, scorecard and all, comes out of scared and inadequate feelings that I won't acknowledge. Regression. I retreat from present threats and conflicts by returning to less mature behavior. An older child may show increases in bedwetting, tantrums, and crying when the new baby arrives. That's normal. In other circumstances, however, regression may be a deficient process reflecting a loss of mature function. Retroflexion. Doing to myself what I would like to do to others. Angry at you, I strangle myself with my throat and chest muscles. Instead of directing effort toward my environment to satisfy my needs, I make myself the target of my own behavior, dividing myself into doer and done to. May show up in statements like, I must control myself. I have to force myself to do this. Sublimation. I direct sexual or aggressive energy into creative or other socially approved channels, sports, dancing, art, and so on. I can have my strong emotions and, through socialization, can express them with full intensity in productive ways. Undoing. Undoing what has been done is my attempt to cancel out the consequences of some unacceptable behavior. I can thus seem to make it non-existent, sometimes by magically or symbolically repeating it in a different way. Wish fulfillment. In my fantasy, I imagine satisfactions that seldom occur in real life. As a frail boy, I dream of myself as Superman. This practice becomes harmful when the daydreams interfere with taking real steps to get what I want. Withdrawal. Withdrawing from a disturbing situation is sometimes adaptive, but may hamper constructive attempts to cope, may be accompanied by apathy and hopelessness, often cloaked in reserve, formality, and apparent self-sufficiency, or the person may become submissive, shy, and retiring. Now that you have a convenient shopping list of more defensive processes than you ever wanted to hear about, what do you do with it? The point, said psychoanalyst Karen Horney, is to start to notice the ones you use, listen to yourself using them, and think back over which others you've used in the past. Each of us uses defense mechanisms according to our needs and disposition. Freud speculated in a 1937 paper that such mechanisms are necessary at certain points in our development but later become counterproductive. When we cling to them, he suggests, they produce an ever-growing alienation from the external world and a permanent enfeeblement. The expenditure of energy necessary to maintain them proves a heavy burden. Psychoanalyst Wilhelm Reich added the idea of character armor, apparently superficial traits or habits that cover deeper anxieties. Someone apprehensive about intimacy, for instance, might adopt formal speech, dress, and or physical mannerisms that discourage others from making overtures toward close contact. Horney suggested that a person may weave together many such traits in a protective organization that pervades all aspects of his or her life. Someone anxious about intimacy could take a job involving little contact with others, live in an impersonal apartment building, and avoid marriage or marry someone who similarly stays away from closeness. The Special Case of Repression Repression fits in the catalog of defensive maneuvers as an all-inclusive process. 
unacceptable ideas or feelings are express mailed to my unconscious bearing the label forget it. Repression occurs in conjunction with many defense mechanisms described earlier and is present to some degree in most of our lives. Anna Freud saw it as a particular hazard. It is capable of mastering powerful instinctual impulses in the face of which the other defensive measures are quite ineffective. It is also the most dangerous mechanism. The withdrawal of consciousness from whole tracks of instinctual and effective life may destroy the integrity of the personality for good. Freud himself saw repression not as a single event, but as an ongoing process that is continually maintained and monitored. The repression can be maintained by one defense mechanism today and a different one tomorrow, just as political repression can be maintained by a police crackdown today and a clever propaganda campaign tomorrow. Dextifying, the inner world of defending, explaining, and justifying. I rationalize when I think everything about me has to make sense in terms of ideas I already hold. Like Spock in Star Trek, I don't allow myself to be illogical and unreasonable or to act in ways that don't fit my self-image or my old shoulds. I've forgotten that it's all right for contradictions to exist in me. The term dextifying is a contraction of the terms defending, explaining, and justifying. Dextifying usually combines rationalization with some of the other defensive processes described earlier. It is a useful word because defending, explaining, and justifying are often used hand in hand for similar purposes. When I justify, I make my actions fit my self-image of being in the right. I reduce my chance to see if I acted as wisely as I could. I also close myself to experiencing what the other person's world would be like for him or her. I justify when I feel that I have to have a reason or an explanation for everything I say or do in case someone, me for instance, questions me. When defending, explaining, and justifying help me avoid some real unwanted outcome, they're useful. If I got stopped by a traffic officer, by the time he gets to my car, I want to have the best dextification going. When my dextifying doesn't serve some deliberate purpose, I view it suspiciously. To the degree that I'm justifying, explaining, and defending what I did, I'm less present and less aware now. But I can learn to let go of my dextifying, at least sometimes. My dextifying distorts what happened. I can seldom truly say why I do the things I do. As children, we don't know why we got angry or took something or hit little brother. If I did know and told the truth, I'd get it. I could say something about the where, when, or what, but since mama or papa demands an explanation or justification rather than a description, I think one up. Eventually, we start believing our own dextifications. With people of all ages, why did you questions are almost always communication breakers that invite the other person into dextifying. Try this. For an entire day, instead of asking why you or anyone else did something, ask what did you do? How did you do it? Ask what without implying why and without implying any judgment or accusation. What difference do you notice in the kind of communication that occurs? Three social psychologists compared the way people responded to excuses, justifications, and apologies. By their definition, in an excuse, I admit the harm in what I did, but deny or minimize my responsibility for doing it. In a justification, I accept responsibility for doing it, but maintain that it needed doing and deny that it was a negative act. In an apology, I accept responsibility for the act, recognize its harmful effects, and ask your pardon. You don't have to justify any way that you are. Just be and know how you're being. You don't have to justify your existence. You're here. Reopening closed feelings. 
I may do something a thousand times and still be unwilling to perceive it if my incentive for keeping it out of my awareness is strong enough. During counseling, one child wailed, you always say just a minute and then you forget about me. Her father replied indignantly, I don't do that. Until he's willing to confront his resistance to recognizing how little importance he gives his daughter's demands, the situation will continue. When I resist awareness, the main thing is not to force myself to stop resisting, which is impossible, but to get to know the processes I use to stay out of touch with thoughts and feelings. My resistance itself becomes the focus of my awareness. As I discover how I dim my awareness, I can choose how and when I want to keep doing that and how and when I don't. When I park one of my defensive processes on the shelf, I don't lose it, but I can choose when and where I want to use it. Reopening closed feelings is a different process than the cognitive learning that most of us are used to. In this affective or emotional learning, change comes more through responding to situations with our feelings than through grasping them with just our intellect. Hopefully, Previously blocked off feelings entering my awareness may seem less frightening, less overpowering now. I become more able to say what I feel when I feel it, and I don't build up a backlog of unexpressed feelings that I inappropriately dump on whoever's available when I've reached the last straw and blow my lid. That is, my cover. I can start opening up to my feelings in areas where I feel fairly safe. Meeting and moving through an impasse. As I let long hidden feelings emerge into the light, I sometimes find myself stuck. I no longer want to act in my old ways, but I'm not sure what to do instead. Even when I'm just living my daily life, I sometimes get similarly stuck, like when I've wanted to make contact with another person but have stopped myself. The point where I stop myself out of my uncertainty and fear is an impasse. Pearl states, the impasse occurs originally when a child cannot get the support from the environment, but cannot yet provide its own support. At that moment of impasse, the child starts to mobilize the environment by playing phony roles, playing stupid, playing helpless, playing weak, flattering, and all the roles that we use in order to manipulate our environment. In my impasse, I have one leg in my past and one leg in the future. I'm refusing to act in my old way, but I can't act easily in my new way yet. I'm stopped, immobilized, confused. Confusion is an excellent distractor. When I'm confused, I don't see anything clearly, especially not what I want to avoid seeing. When I explore my confusion, I often find that I want two different things but can't have both. The situation is like that of a person wanting two lovers. Which one shall I choose may be an issue. Kurt Lewin, the father of modern social psychology, called this an approach-approach conflict. On the other hand, I may feel attracted to a certain person but also afraid of him. This is an approach avoidance conflict. Or I may have two lovers and strongly like and strongly dislike certain things about each. This is a double approach avoidance conflict. An impasse may be a double approach avoidance conflict. I dislike my old way, but it's easy. I'm attracted by the new way, but it's scary and uncertain. An impasse is a crucial point in growth. At this point, actively or by default, I choose whether to be alive, to move forward into unfamiliar challenge and uncertainty, or to retreat to my well-worn ways and, in a sense, to die. I face an existential crisis. Moving through an impasse. I can move out of an impasse by focusing on what I'm doing right now. How am I keeping myself stuck and dead? What can I do to find my aliveness? A sometimes frightening aspect of working through an impasse is that when I give up my old way before I have a clear sense of my new way, 
I may spend some time in limbo. In the days when I was heavily committed to my showman self, I was sometimes so busy acting that I didn't tune in to important events in other people and in myself. I didn't know what my alternative would be, so I felt anxious when I stopped performing. When I stop worrying about the impression I want to create and start paying attention to my present experience, my anxiety can diminish rapidly and I can still enjoy performing. Sometimes when I've moved through an impasse and into a new way of being, I go back to check out the old behavior before leaving it completely, just to make sure it's still there and available. This is normal, not something to despair about. First, it reassures me that I can still use my old ways when I want them. I haven't burned my bridges behind me. Second, it's a means of testing my newfound strength. I feel stronger when I know I can cross the bridge again and continue on my new road. Layers of energy. Moving through an impasse often requires getting in touch with deeper levels of myself. Pearls views the personality as consisting of several layers. At the surface is the cliche layer. Reverend James Walker describes it well. The cliché layer consists of the tokens of relationship that we take for granted, such as saying good morning, shaking hands, and various other forms of limited relationship. These tokens can be leads or openings into more meaningful contact, or they can be ways of setting limits to our relationships. Beneath the cliché layer lies the roles and games layer. I pretend so I can get what I want. I get in trouble when I forget that my role is a role, that my game is a game. My mask sticks to my face, I can't breathe well, and I forget who I am beneath it. When I break through my role, but just have begun to sense my underlying personal self, at first I may feel as though I'm in a void with no ground beneath my feet. This is what Pearls calls the death layer. This death layer or implosion layer is where I deaden my senses and put my brakes on. I turn my energy in on itself and implode, the opposite of explode. I've dropped my social front, but I'm not yet in full contact with my inner excitement. I may feel bored, lonely, or flat and desolate, like an emotional wasteland. There's one place I can always find this energy I keep locked up in my body. When I am tight and tense, I can be sure I have some imploded energy. When I focus my awareness on how I constrict my muscles, deaden my body, and make myself heavy as I move, thoughts and feelings connected with these sensations start to come alive. When I contact these feelings inside me, I may explode out of my death layer into a wild display of my grief or anger or joy or even orgasm if I've inhibited my sexual energy. This newly unleashed life force demands expression. At this crucial point, some people make the error of saying, I'm finished with my phony social self and throw their whole social living situation overboard, family, home, job, everything. For some people, this can be right. For others, it's not. Being for me involves me and caring for you. Caring for you is part of my being for me. Happiness. Happiness is a goal we seek or a byproduct of our involvement in activities we enjoy or deem worthwhile. From either perspective, we can identify some of the principal obstacles to happiness and assess how best to deal with them. Obstacles to happiness. Drawing from the thinking of Abe Arkoff from 1980, we find that the obstacles to happiness include 1. Feeling worthless, that you're of no value or a bad person and your life is no good. Congratulations, you're poisoning yourself with introjected valuations borrowed from others. 2. Not allowing yourself enough pleasure. This is the glory of the workaholic, who's always running and pushing to get the next thing done. I have so many crucial things I have to do. To counter this, evaluate how many of these crucial things will realistically result in your life falling apart if left undone. 
do those, make a list of all others, and start replacing them with relaxing pleasures. Allow yourself enough hedonic units in the form of relaxation and pleasure, remembering that these can contribute to achieving as well as to happiness. 3. Feeling a deficit of excitement or fulfillment. You've locked yourself into daily routines. Find where you can make room for fun, excitement, or creative activities. 4. Feeling a deficit of warmth and caring, touching and holding. You might try saying, I really need a hug right now to someone likely to be receptive. This may involve developing your assertiveness. A second approach is to let others contact you, to hear their needs and respond to them. Once you respond to others' needs, they're more apt to respond to yours. A third approach is to change some of your environment to provide what you need, like taking a massage or dance class. Desire and happiness. When I want, I have options. When I need, I'm more demanding. When I'm hungry, I can wait to eat, but when I'm starving, I can't. My needs may be physical or psychological. When I'm concerned only with my survival, I have less room to think about you. When I'm dealing with my desires, I have room to think about who you are, what we have available for each other, and what we don't. As I begin to recognize the difference between what I need to survive and what I want in order to feel fulfilled, I can look more clearly at how my ways of getting what I want affect my existence. Experimental psychologist John Huston talks about two aspects of desire. One is that we want things we can't have. The other is that we may not want what we have. The latter point is especially intriguing. For us to get maximum pleasure from satisfying a desire, he says, we have to feel at least a little bit deprived. Eating a banana cream pie after just having consumed a banana cream pie is not as satisfying. Houston suggests that we are happier when we're meeting and overcoming obstacles and then enjoying the rewards than when all our needs are automatically and continuously satisfied. He suggests the intriguing strategy of intentional deprivation. My friend Judy describes an excellent example. When I lived in Italy with my husband, who worked for the army, he could get anything he wanted at the PX. Since the finest liquors, tax-free, were unbelievably cheap, he, every night we drank the finest. The edge quickly went off our enjoyment of the rare and wonderful liquors. Finally, I began to scour the countryside for local wines available at reasonable prices for everyone in the area. We discovered that they, too, added to our enjoyment of a meal and when we occasionally had the very best, it felt like a special occasion. As I desire, so I live, say the Upanishads in 1957. With possessions, relationships, achievements, or any other area of my life, I may not realize that some of my wants are really introjected scripts, someone else's should wants. I can examine each of my desires. Will fulfilling it help me feel better with myself and my life? There's still, however, that other troublesome side of desire, wanting what we can't have. One of the keys to liberation is learning to let go of our attachments to what we desire, to say to myself and feel at a deep level, so be it, that's all right, when I come up against something that I can't have. Ken Keyes uses the term addictions for attachments that are so strong that we refuse to be happy unless they're satisfied. An addiction, he writes, is any desire that makes you upset or unhappy if it is not satisfied. Even if an addiction brings you pleasure, it is usually short-lived. When I'm intent on satisfying an addiction, I relinquish most of my consideration for anybody else. When I'm willing to accept a somewhat different experience instead of what I wanted, says Keyes, my addiction is transformed into a preference. I don't have to have it. I can accept what is, detach from that desire, and enjoy myself another way. I don't have to feel bad about the desires I do have. Some time ago, for example, my car was stuck in the mud. 
At last we got it out. Then, as I backed down the long road, I got stuck again. I was in a hurry, feeling hassled and uptight. The second time was the last straw. Believe me, I strongly desired not to be stuck. I got out of my car, jumped up and down, beat the ground with my shovel, and screamed and shook my fists at the sky. My emotional age at that point was about two, counting the time in utero. At the same time, I could appreciate the exquisite absurdity of what I was doing. I could see the comedy of that moment in my life for what it was, laughing with myself while I was tearing my hair out. I'm glad I didn't put myself down by telling myself I shouldn't feel upset. As Zen master Jakusho Kwong points out, if I'm the fourth horse on the team, instead of trying to be the first horse, I can be the best fourth horse I can. Then, I am the first horse. I don't have to sit waiting to be something I'm not instead of living now. Laughter, joy, and joie de vivre. Laughter is so widely accepted that the restraints against it are more apt to be from the inside than from the outside. Feeling good is allowing my energy to move, to flow, and be free. If I stop myself from showing my good feelings, I stop the flow of my life force and I actually don't feel as good. I don't hurt anyone by enjoying myself. Many times I come through painful places in my life by finding moments when I can smile at my situation and find some lightness in it. I can't do this by going around my pain and pretending it's not there. I have to go through the pain to get to the other side. When I can laugh at myself in my difficult situations, I'm more open to new ideas and new approaches. The other day, I got really angry, picked up the dining room table and bounced it like a checkerboard. Suddenly, I realized what I was doing and saw how impressed my family was with my great rage as I jumped up and down as though I were going to move the universe. Then we all broke up laughing. That added something important that said, I am my anger as I am my laughter and my love. If my life were only absurd, it wouldn't be worth it. When it's so exquisitely absurd that I can stand here breaking up with laughter at myself, it's very absurdity is nourishing. End of chapter 14